I didn't expect how emotional this would be. But that, I just, thank you so much. And um, somebody asked me how I feel. I feel scared. Um, that's the main emotion. Um, but uh, this is a great church. And if it weren't a great church, I wouldn't want to be the head pastor. But it's a great church. And I'm so, so happy and uh, so honored that God would lead my family and I to this point and uh, into the future. And so with that being said, I, I, I would like you to turn your Bibles because I don't know what else to say once you kind of reach that point of just, except let's just all read the Bible. Um, <laughs> uh, go ahead and turn into to Matthew chapter six. But when my, when my wife and I got married in, in August of 2008 in this room, I didn't know that it would bring me back, God would bring me back here. And as he, as he has worked in our lives and as he has led us through life, I have found that transition and change is just part of what we do as human beings. Uh, in, our first eight, or in our first nine years of marriage, we lived in 10 different places. Uh, most of that was because we were poor and we were trying to find the best deal. Um, and, and, and during that time, we were in, co- or in our master's program, both of us were in seminary, which meant that, that every four months, your whole life gets turned upside down, right? A semester ends and you have to redo all your schedule, when you can do your jobs and when you can get your, your shifts in at whatever, wherever you're working. And, and, and during our, that, that time, I held four different jobs. Uh, and Mary, I, I didn't count Mary, she held quite a few different ones too. And, and it just, there was a lot of transition. And as a young married couple, we often weren't sure how to deal with that. And so we, there was a lot of stress, a lot of confusion, a lot of conversation. And I remember my wife saying something so profound that it stuck with me to this day. And she said, I feel like we often are looking for normal, but really life is a bunch of transitions with a little bit of normal in between. And I think that's, that's something good for us to remember. Life is constantly changing. And as we experience a change here this morning, uh, it, it won't be the last change in your life, not just in church, but in, in general life. But I think we need to define the difference between change and transition. Often people say the word transition and what they really mean is change. And here's what I mean by that. You might say, Matt, you're splitting hairs. And, I, and I'm not, I'm not, because this, this is how things work. A change is an event or situation that occurs where something was one thing and now it's something different. And it happens in a moment in time. A transition is the process which happens after an event has occurred. So after a change has occurred, the transition is the internal struggle that you all and I feel to figure out what is life gonna look like now and how do I fit into it? As we looked into the past, we go, hey, I know what life looked like there. I know how I functioned in it. But now that this change has occurred, what therefore do I do? How do I behave? Where's my place in all this? And then whether you like it or not, you're going through it. I'm going through it. Your staff is going through it in this church. And it's something we just have to call for what it is. A change has occurred and a transition has begun. And so the internal struggle that you feel that you maybe are experiencing, it's okay. It's normal. It's part of life. And in fact, I've been reading on transition and I I grabbed this, uh, guys, go ahead and put that picture up for me. I grabbed this photo from a book that I'm reading called Managing Transition by William and Susan Bridges. And I love how he has laid it out. Is it up there? Okay, good. Um, I love how he has laid it out because everybody that I've read somewhere along the line falls into this. And the first one is at the bottom here and it's endings. And then you have neutral zone and then you have the new beginning. We as Americans love innovation, right? We love the new. And what we wanna do is rush right past everything else and get to the new as soon as possible. But guys, I'm telling you, in order for us to transition as a church well, what we have to do is pause and sit in what's ending for a time. And when you do that, you begin to feel emotions and that's okay too. Guys, especially for you, it's okay. We begin to feel emotions of maybe nostalgia and sadness. Why? Because something that was happening is ending. 
And when we look now into the past and we see what God did in this church, what God did in your life through this church, what God did in the community through this church. You know, we talked, Brian, last week talked about 4,000 baptisms since the church started. 4,000 baptisms. God moved mightily through this church. And we wanna look into the, to the, the, the past and we will go, that, that season of ministry is ending, but man, was it great. Man, was it great. It's similar to when I was in college. I remember graduation happened and I hung out with my buddies for the last time. There's this little lake. We all went down there on campus and we, we, just, we spent some time together. And I remember getting in my car and I was the last one to leave and I was driving away. And I remember thinking, never again, why be a student at Taylor University with these guys in this moment and have this life? Never again, it's over. I, I mean, I could go back and re-enroll at Taylor University and, right, and go through those years again, it wouldn't have been the same, right? And I'm driving away going, I am not paying any more money to that university for a degree, right? And so, and, and, but here's the thing, it was interesting because I was also excited. I was moving to California to, to, to work in a ministry there. I was excited about what was coming, but man, it was sad leaving behind what I had experienced. So much spiritual growth. Those friendships are still, are still intact. Those guys were in my wedding. They, they're, they're people that I vacation with at times. Like, like I, it was a great season and, and I was sad to see it end. But I was excited about what was coming. But, but, and, and so I spent some time just remembering, just going through the memories. And so I wanna encourage you to do that. As we, as we enter into a new season, just spend time. Maybe you'll write them out. Write out some of the memories you have of times where God used this church, Pastor John, in your life and how great it was, and how, how impactful it was and how you grew out of it. Do that because that's how you end a season of life well. You honor it. You look in the past and go, that was great. And so that's the endings. The, the next one is, is the neutral zone. And with the neutral zone, this one is actually, I think, the toughest because maybe you're okay with the ending, you've worked through it, and, but yet the new hasn't fully come yet. It's not fully operational. It's not fully going. It's not hitting on all cylinders. And so you're still trying to figure out where do I land in this? What does this look like? That's the neutral zone. Some people call it a waiting period because you're kind of waiting to see how you fit. And it is nerve wracking because you're just ready to go. You're ready to jump in. You're ready to start moving forward. But the reality is you don't know how. And that's okay too. And, and, and this one actually will feel like it lasts longer than you expect it to. And you think about the Israelites, God brings them out of Egypt and he has not yet put them in the promised land. They have 40 years in the wilderness, 40 years of traveling around, of sand, of putting up tents, of not having a home. That was a neutral zone for them. We are not gonna have 40 years here. Lord have mercy if we have 40 years there, right? But, but it just as an example, like, you know, there'll be a time where we're just not quite to what's new yet. David, I think, is the best example. He's anointed king, and then what happens? He has to run for his life for years to keep away from Saul. He eventually has to even go to the land of the Philistines to find safety from Saul. It, he, was in, he was in the neutral zone. He was in the waiting period of becoming king. But you know what was happening during that period? God was refining his character so that he would be a great king and a great leader. So as we're in the neutral zone, as it can be tough because we're ready to get going, lean into the Lord because God's refining you as an individual and he's refining us as a church for what is coming next. And then of course is the new beginnings. And that's where God brings us to that place where we know how we fit in. We know what we're doing. We're operating 100%. We are moving forward. And guys, that's when things will get fun because we're gonna see people come to know Jesus. We're gonna see people baptized. We're gonna see, we're gonna see amazing things happen in central Ohio. In Ohio as a state, in the country and around the world. I know that will happen because God has his hand on his church. And that hand is evident from what he's done in the past. It didn't come with me. It was already here. God's just allowed me to get to be part of it. God's hand will move. So as we end well, and as we're in the neutral zone, figuring things out in the new beginning, know that the emotions that come is, is normal. And so I encourage you to just think of this as we, as we kind of transition into something new, all right? Now with that though, I wanna kind of equip you today to figure out how do we move through that process? And there's, there's, 
kind of two groups of things. There's things we believe and there's things we can do. There are two things which we believe. And one, uh, I want you to turn to Exodus 34. Sorry, I know I turned you to Matthew. Now we're gonna go back to Exodus here. Exodus 34. And in Exodus 34, Moses is going up on the mountain with the Lord. The Lord's coming down to meet him. This is around the time he has the tablets for the 10 commandments. Um, but he goes up and in 34 chapter five, Exodus 34 chapter five, listen to this. The Lord came down in a cloud, stood with him there and proclaimed his name, the Lord. The Lord passed in front of him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord is a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger and abounding in faithful love and truth, maintaining faithful love to a thousand generations, forgiving iniquity, rebellion and sin, but he will not leave the guilty unpunished, bringing the father's iniquity on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generation. Moses said, or in verse eight, it says, Moses immediately knelt low on the ground and worshiped. Then he said, my Lord, if I have indeed found favor with you, my Lord, please go with us. Even though this is a stiff-necked people, forgive our iniquity and our sin and accept us as your own possession. And then verse 10, the Lord responded, look, I am making a, I, look, I am making a covenant. He's making a covenant with Moses. Now, I don't believe you guys are stiff-necked, all right? Just hear me on that. Don't believe you're stiff-necked. But what I love about this is you have Moses before the Lord and, Mo, and he's saying, God, before I go, I want you to come with me. I want you to come with me. And as we enter this next season, that's what we need to be asking. Lord, come with us. Why? Because God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God never changes. So though things in this world change, and like I said earlier, sometimes there's a lot of transition and change with a little bit of normal in the middle. Though that's happening, God always remains the same. And who is God? He's compassionate, he's gracious, he's slow to anger, he's abounding in faithful love and truth, and he maintains faithful love to thousands of generations. He forgives us. That's who God is. God does not change. You have to, in the words of Pastor John, you have to lock that down because God does not change no matter what you face. He's always going to be compassionate. He is always going to be gracious. He is always going to be slow to anger. He's always going to be forgiving. And I would say he's always going to be loving. I love Lamentations uh, 3, 21 through 24. It says, yet I call this to mind and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's faithful love, we do not perish. For his mercies never end. They are new every morning. Great is his faithfulness. God does not change. No matter what else changes, God remains the same. So no matter how you're feeling, know that God is with you, that he loves you, and that he does not change. Lean into that. The other thing to believe, believe and remember that who you are in Christ never changes. Who you are in Christ never changes. If you have given your life to Christ, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your King and your Lord, if you have surrendered to him and said, you are my Lord and my King, I will follow you, who you are in him never changes. And who you are is this, Colossians 1, 13 through 14. He has rescued us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. In him, we have redemption the forgiveness of sins. You are redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You are forgiven. That's always true about you. And then God has also made you new. Think about that. Think about who you were before Christ. Think about what your life was like and how God has made you new. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Do you hear that? A new creation. It's like a totally different being. The old has passed away and see the new has come. Why are you new? Because Christ has forgiven you. The old man was condemned to hell. The old man was struggling with sin. The old man was, was in chains because of sin. But now that you have accepted Christ, you are new. And that new person is holy. That new person is redeemed. That new person is forgiven. That's who you are. And then I will say this too about who you are in Christ. You are an adopted child of God. The king of the universe took people like me and like you who are unworthy, unholy sinners 
and adopted you and made us his heir. Romans 8, 15 says, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. That word Abba is the Hebrew term for daddy. That you are an adopted child of God and therefore you can look at the God of the universe and call him by the most familiar of children's terms, daddy. I remember when my wife and I were having um, our first child, I told her, uh, I'm not gonna be daddy. Yeah, gonna be dad, strong. The first time daddy came out of my son's mouth, I said, that's it, I'm fine with it. Call me daddy all you want, right? There's this familiarity with your child that comes from that and we've been given that. We've been adopted. So who is God? Always is the same, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And who are you in Christ remains the same. You are redeemed, you are forgiven, you are adopted, you are made new. No matter what change is happening, that always remains the same. Now let's go to Matthew chapter five. Because the other things, those are just things to believe. Here's what we do during change. All right, and I'm just gonna give you a quick, quick summary. This is the Sermon on the Mount. Sermon on the Mount starts with the Beatitudes where Jesus basically flips the kingdom. He says, instead of the powerful, the rich and the wealthy are the blessed ones. Actually, it's the poor, the struggling and the humble. Those are the ones that I bless. And so everything gets turned upside down. And then he tells the Jews, he says, look, I am the fulfillment of the law. And what he means by that is the Jewish people followed the Old Testament law for righteousness. They said, look, if I do all these things right, I will be righteous before God and I will be acceptable to God. And Jesus says, look, it's not actually by doing all that. I am the fulfillment of the law. Righteousness is found in me, not in following the rules. And then he redefines the, 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 the Old Testament law through talking about murder and adultery and divorce and telling the truth, going the second mile, loving your enemy. Those are all passages from Exodus and, and Deuteronomy that he then teaches in a new way with him being the fulfillment of it and saying, look, instead of just following all these rules, it's actually more about the heart. And if your heart belongs to me, you will receive righteousness says, because I'm the fulfillment of the law. And in and the end of the chapter, he says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly father is perfect. Jesus is saying, look, you have the ability to be perfect now because I'm here. You can have righteousness through me. You couldn't do it through following the rules. One, you couldn't, do, you couldn't follow the rules that well. But now you have me. And then he goes into chapter six. And I love chapter six, verse one, where he says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. So what he's saying, is he's saying, obviously the 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 obvious thing is like, look, don't just live a righteous life. Don't just do good things so that people praise you. Your heart has to be for me. But notice he says, be careful not to practice your what? Your righteousness. And he's saying, look, you find your righteousness in me. And when I've granted to you, make sure you live it well. Make sure you live it well. Second Corinthians 5, 21 says, he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. You as a child of God are righteous in God's eyes. You have his righteousness. Live it well. Don't live it to, to impress others. And, and, and then he gives us three things that we can do here. And it's we give, we pray, and we fast. He doesn't say if you do these things. He says whenever or when you do these three things. We live out our righteousness through those three tools. Now, I want you to keep going with me though, because we're gonna get to a, the main point here. Then after we talk about giving, praying, and fasting as, living, as ways to live out God's righteousness, he talks about possessions. And he says, look, don't store up for yourself possessions on earth. Don't do that because they're gonna fall apart. Store up for yourself treasure in heaven with me. Don't get too involved in this earth with storing up stuff. Don't make this earth your goal. And then after this, he goes into what we call the cure for anxiety. But there's, there's more to it than that. He's saying, look, don't worry about what you eat. Don't worry about what you drink. And don't worry about what you wear. He says, don't worry about those. God knows you need them. And like a good father, he will give you what you need. So instead of storing up for things on this, uh, treasures on this earth, instead of seeking our daily needs, you know what he says and said? Verse 33, chapter six, verse 33, he says, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be provided for you. 
the Sermon on the Mount comes to a, a main point here. We find our righteousness in Jesus Christ. And the whole point that now we've been given, our purpose is to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. No matter what's happening here, no matter how activity is swirling around, that's where we need to land. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Seek first God's way. Seek first his, his will. Seek first his face and his righteousness, and he will get us where we need to be. That's where we have to start a new season. So how do we do that? Well, he's given us three things. Giving, praying, praying and fasting. With giving. Giving is when, it's, it, and, and this is talking about financial giving, and I do believe that. I do believe in the tithe that you need to be giving of your first fruits financially, but there's more to it than that. When, when, you're, when life is swirling all around you and a change or transition is happening, look for something to give to somebody else. Whether that's a financial gift, whether it's time, whether it's resources, it's basically find somebody else to serve. Find somebody else to take care of. When life just seems to be circling around, find somebody to take care of. Find something to give away. And ultimately, what do we want to give away? What's the one commodity that the church has the corner on the market? What's the one thing that we have that nobody else has? And it's Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the basis of this community here. And no other community is like that. The church is the body of Christ with Jesus at the, as the head. We are the bride of Christ. Let's give Jesus away. No matter what's happening, no matter where you're trying to figure out where you're fit, whether you're in the ending or neutral zone or new beginning, give Jesus away. And the second thing is prayer. With prayer, notice in, in chapter six, verse nine, with the Lord's prayer, you know what he says? He goes, therefore you should pray like this, our Father in heaven, your name be honored as holy, your kingdom come your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When we pray, we should seek God's kingdom first. So I encourage all of you, let's be praying. God, show us how to seek first your kingdom and your righteousness. And then the last one, well, with the praying, just guys, prayer works. And, and, and even in the midst of confusion, I remember one time uh, my wife and I for our first son, we went to get an ultrasound and the ultrasound, the doctor was super calm. Uh, he, was, he was not the, our normal doctor. And he said, hey, you know, we can't really see his hands. So we're gonna get a, a better ultrasound. And we said, okay. So I'm walking with the doctor and he like super calmly walked up to the, uh, the nurse and was like, hey, they need to go to the pregnancy care center right now and get the best ultrasound they have because we can't see this kid's hands. Um, so I'm not sure if he has any. All right, can you schedule that for him? And then he walked away. And I'm going, that just got serious real quick, right? Like it went from we can't see his hands to he may not have them. And then the guy goes, hey, have a good day and walked away. And you're like, oh, geez. so Mary and I went to, we, this lady scheduled it and it was like three hours later. So we're sitting at Chick-fil-A. You know, we're just staring at each other and we don't know what to say and we prayed. And I'm not gonna embarrass him, but I could have Caleb hold his hands up and his hands are there, right? You know, but just the peace that we had by asking God, hey, please let our son have hands. You know, like, like, but you know, and there's times where maybe he wouldn't have done that. But when we prayed, we found peace in knowing we had a God who was with us that heard us. And then we, we praised him for the answer to prayer. Because we did the next ultrasound. It was like, boom, he put his hands right up there. And the lady was like, right away. Prayer works. But let's, so let's pray for God's kingdom to come in central Ohio. And then the last one is fasting. And this is the one I really wanna draw our attention to today. Fasting is not eating or taking sustenance for a time in order to seek the Lord for something. In the Bible, you see it, it's, mo it's always no food, sometimes no water. Um, and, and it's just either it's corporate or it's individual, but people are saying, look, God, something's happening to us. And so we want to acknowledge you that actually, God, you're more important to us than food. Your, your life is more real than physical life we could get through sustenance. So we turn our eyes to you and we ask for you to rescue us. We ask for you to guide us. We ask for you to give us wisdom. And so what I want to do kind of as my first, in my first sermon, my first ask ask of the congregation is to follow me in a 40 day fast. Now we're not gonna fast from food for 40 days. That's unhealthy, right? But what I'm asking us to do starting September 11th, 
Not today, not tomorrow, September 11th. I'm gonna give you a week to pray about it. Starting September 11th, we're gonna start a 40 day fast. It'll start on September 11th, it'll end on October 20th. And we are going to fast as a congregation to seek the Lord. To say, God, as we enter a new season of life, we wanna seek you. We want to do things your way. And how it'll look for me is I am every week of the 40 days, I'm going to fast for one, from food, and, uh, from food, not water, but from food for one 24 hour period. So it ended up being about six. And the other thing I'm gonna do on a daily basis is I'm gonna fast from listening to things, meaning music, podcasts, TV. Anytime I'm alone, I'm not going to be listening to something. Instead, I'm gonna replace that with prayer. So instead of going on a walk to kind of clear my head and popping in my headphones and listening to music or a podcast or some kind of teaching, I'm going to just walk in silence and I'm going to pray. Instead of driving my car and turning on the radio, I'm gonna keep it in silence and I'm going to pray. Because part of the fasting that we can do is we're going to stop doing something for 40 days in order to pray and ask God for his guidance for Jersey Church. And I'm asking us to do this together because this is our, this is our community, right? This is not just me, this is us. God, what do you want us to do? So starting September 11th, we're gonna fast. I wanna encourage you this week, pray about something you can fast from. Maybe it's not food. And, and if you have a health concern, listen, that's okay. You don't need to do food. If you have a health concern, don't do food. But maybe it's, maybe it's music, maybe it's TV, maybe it's video games. Maybe for some of us, it's caffeine or desserts. I don't know, I don't know what it is, but I encourage you this week to pray about giving something up for 40 days that we can seek the face of God. And when we seek the face of God, this is what he promises us. Second Chronicles seven fourteen, God says, when my people who bear my name, humble themselves, pray and seek my face and turn from their evil ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. Whether you know it or not, there are people in America who are broken. There are people like me who are broken, people like you who are broken, but we've found the solution in Jesus Christ. We need God's hand of healing to heal the people in America, in Ohio, in our county, and around the world. And God has a plan for us to participate in that. God has a plan for this church to help people, not just in Ohio, not just in America, but around the world, find healing in him but we've got to seek his face in order to know what that is. So September 11th, it's going to start. It's a week from tomorrow. I want you to be praying about what you're going to fast from. Let's do this as a body together so that God can show us how he wants us to follow him in the next season of life. Amen? Amen. 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 Let me pray. God, I thank you that you are a God that's unchanging. I thank you that my life and the life of those who have given their lives to you in this church is unchanging in that we are new, we are redeemed, we're forgiven, we're adopted. And Lord, as we enter a new season of ministry, as we enter a new season of this church's life, Lord, we seek your face and your guidance. Lead us in the way we should go. Lord, give us wisdom on how we fast in the next, in the, starting in the next week. Give us wisdom on what to do, Father, that we can seek your face and lift up the lost before you. Lift up the purpose of this church moving into the next season before you. Holy Spirit, help us and guide us. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen.